research enabled location prediction of Twitter users. First off, I would like to thank my committee members, Dr. Sher, Dr. Prasad, and Dr. Duran. And thank you all for coming here. Uh, please feel free to uh, treat yourself to a Starbucks coffee. Can anyone tell me uh, what they read here? Right, so uh, we know that Buckeye State is the nickname for the state of Ohio. So when we read a piece of text like this, uh, we use that general knowledge to interpret it as the state of Ohio. In general, we use uh, our experience and general knowledge for the interpretation of any piece of text or discourse. Similarly, we can use Buckeye knowledge to improve a machine's ability to interpret text. Buckeye knowledge, represented as ontologies, have been core to the idea of semantic web. In a keynote presented in September 2000, Dr. Shedd talked about capturing and applying existing knowledge to semantic applications. This was in the context of a semantic search engine that used semi-automated algorithms to um, capture uh, existing knowledge and create domain-specific ontologies. Since then, um, ontologies like Wikipedia, Music Brains, UMLS, etc., have been used to solve many problems like uh, name entity recognition and translation, uh, relevant document retrieval, etc. Today, I'm going to talk about how we can use background knowledge to predict the geographic location of a Twitter user. In this context, by geographic location, I mean uh, the home location of a Twitter user at the city level. As we know, social media has grown rapidly in the last few years. Twitter is a microblogging website that allows its users to post and receive short textual updates. As the user base and popularity of Twitter has increased, a lot of applications based on Twitter have been developed. These applications can use location as uh, for value addition. So a lot of interest has been shown in the geographic footprint of a Twitter user. For example, uh, personalization and recommendation system can use uh, location to provide additional context. For example, a news recommender system can use the location of a user to provide, uh, to recommend uh, local articles which may be more relevant to the user. Similarly, location can also be used in uh, uh, targeted advertising, opinion analysis, disaster re uh, response, and location-based services. Given that there are so many applications of uh, uh, the location of a Twitter user, how can we obtain this information? One way is when the location is uh, location information is volunteered by the user. So a Twitter user can publish their uh, location information in two ways. One is by geotagging each of their tweets. So when you use your mobile device to send a tweet, you can tag each tweet with the latitude and longitude information. Alternately, you can uh, use your Twitter profile to enter your location information. So uh, the location field in the Twitter profile is a freeform text box. So this allows you to enter location at any granularity that you want. For example, you may choose to just enter your country, or you may choose to enter just your state, or if your users choose to uh, enter city, comma, state in this field. But many studies have found that less than 4% of tweets contain geospatial tags. And location information uh, in the profile is either left empty or people enter invalid information. For example, a study found that uh, teenage girls popularly write Justin Bieber's heart as their location in the Twitter profile. Given these statistics, there was a need to input the location of a user automatically. The existing approaches to input the location of a user can be grouped in two classes. Network-based approaches and content-based approaches. Network-based approaches exploit the uh, network of a Twitter user to predict their location. These approaches use a training data set of users whose location have been already published and they uh, identify hidden patterns in the communication between the users and their friends, followers, and followees, and use these observations 
to predict the location of a user whose location is not known. The drawback of this, uh, this approach is that um, to predict the location of a user, a significant number of users in the network of this user should have published their location, in the absence of which these algorithms cannot be applied. The second class of approaches are the content-based approaches, which are based on the tweets of a user. So the assumption of these approaches is that the tweets of a user reflect their geographic location. For example, users tend to tweet about important landmarks, sports teams, etc. of their geographic location. The uh, approaches which have been proposed for content-based uh, to predict the location of a user based on their tweets are uh, broadly they are mainly supervised approaches, <coughs> probabilistic models, uh, topic models, language models, etc. have been proposed. Our work is inspired by uh, that of Chen et al., who proposed a probabilistic framework to uh, understand the geographical distribution of words. They proposed the concept of local words, which are words that have significant uh, association with a specific location. For example, using a training data set of 4 million tweets, their model uh, concluded that casino is a word which is more local to uh, Las Vegas. Red Sox is a word which is local to Boston. We know that Boston Red Sox are a baseball team from uh, the city of Boston. So the disadvantage of these um, existing approaches is that they are supervised and they require a training data set of geotagged tweets, that is tweets, whose, or tweets from users whose location is already known. So if you had to uh, build this model, they built the model for uh, continental United States, if you had to build this model for say China or India, you would have to repeat the process of collecting the uh, training data set of geotagged tweets from the new region and then creating uh, create a model for these regions which would understand the probabilistic distribution of words across these regions. My thesis addresses the weaknesses of these approaches by predicting an unsupervised approach that predicts the geographic uh, location of a user by creating a location-specific knowledge base which extracts local entities from uh, Wikipedia. The core contribution of this work is the creation of a location-specific knowledge base uh, from uh, Wikipedia, which is uh, publicly available. And uh, to apply this approach to a new region like, say, China or India, we do not need to collect any training data set of tweets, and creation of a location-specific knowledge uh, base requires just a single parse of the Wikipedia dump. Our approach consists of these three modules, the knowledge base generator, which creates a location specific, uh, which creates a knowledge base for each city and consists of location specific concepts. A user profile generator that creates a semantic profile of user based on the uh, entities mentioned in their tweets. And a location, predicti uh, location prediction module that uses the knowledge base and the semantic profile of the user to predict the location of the user. I'll talk about the knowledge base generator now. So similar to the idea of local words, we propose the concept of local entities, which are entities that have a strong association with a particular location. For example, Golden Gate Bridge can be considered as local with respect to San Francisco. New York Knicks, uh, who are a baseball team based out of New York City, can be considered as a local entity with respect to New York City. We extract uh, local entities for each city from Wikipedia. Wikipedia, as we know, is a publicly available collaborative encyclopedia. Uh, as of 2014, it's available in 287 languages. The English edition is the largest, with uh, 4.6 million articles and 18 million page views. So it's available to uh, everyone in public. Anyone can go and edit a Wikipedia artic 
helpful, correct any errors, compensate for any biases, etc. So Wikipedia has been used as an external uh, knowledge base for many applications. It's been used for uh, name identity recognition and design decoration, etc. There are two main features of Wikipedia which have been used. One is the category structure of Wikipedia. So each concept or each article in Wikipedia is considered to be uh, representing one concept. And concepts are grouped in a hierarchy with each concept belonging to one or more categories. This category structure has been used for document clustering, tweet classification, personalization systems, etc. At Noasis, a lot of work has been done which has used Wikipedia. Uh, for example, user used uh, the used the category structure for creating domain-specific uh, ontologies. Blooms used the category structure for ontology alignment. And more recently, um, the hierarchical interest graph uh, used the category structure for creating a personalization system for Twitter users. Another uh, important feature of Wikipedia is its link structure. Each article in Wikipedia links to other <coughs> Wikipedia articles, and this forms a hyperlink graph. This link structure has been used for uh, solving problems like word sense, disambiguation, semantic relatedness, etc. Our approach uh, uses the uh, link structure of Wikipedia to extract local entities for each city. So consider this article from a semantic web page of Wikipedia. It contains links to RDF and web ontology language. So a user these links to the uh, to their respective Wikipedia pages. So a user who is viewing this page and is not familiar with these concepts can link uh, can click on these uh, links and browse to the Wikipedia pages of these concepts. You'll notice that there are also other concepts like data, people, airplane, etc., which are not topically relevant to semantic web, but they have their own Wikipedia pages. But you see that there are no links to these concepts. That is because um, the Wikipedia guidelines state that links should be present only for concepts which are relevant to the main page, which means that RDF and web ontology language are topically relevant or semantically related to semantic web, whereas data, people, airplane, etc. are not. Hence the links to these concepts. We use this property and we consider the internal links of location pages as local entities of that city. For example, with respect to San Francisco, uh, consider this piece of text from Wikipedia. There are all these links to Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz Island, uh, Alcatraz Prison, Chinatown, etc. And we consider these entities as local with respect to San Francisco. So the idea is to create a knowledge base consisting of these local entities with respect to a given location and use the presence of these entities in the tweets of a user as evidence to their actual location or as clues towards their actual location. Now you'll notice that San Francisco does not have a link to itself. But in our knowledge base, we still consider the name of the city as a local entity. That's because intuitively you would think that the name of a location provides evidence to the actual location of a user. And uh, previous studies have also shown that location names are important clues towards predicting the location of the user. So the city name is a local entity in our knowledge base too. Now this is a graph of local entities extracted from the Wikipedia pages of all the cities in US with population greater than 5,000. To what extent do you use the one step away uh, knowledge? We use just the one step away knowledge which I talked about before, which is the knowledge of Golden Gate Bridge, the Wikipedia page of Golden and, Gate Bridge. And uh, would, do, you, do you know if it will make any difference if you start using also all the all the entities that occur in the Golden Gate Bridge? Also? We use that. You use that. Okay. Yeah. So I'll talk about that too. So this is a 
graph of entities that uh, uh, local entities extracted from the Wikipedia page of locations of cities in US with population greater than 5,000. So you'll see that uh, the count of local entities is anywhere from between 30 to 800. For example, San Francisco has 717 local entities and the city of Fairbourn, Ohio has 110 local entities. Consider this snippet from the uh, media section of the Wikipedia page of San Francisco. It talks about all the local newspapers uh, based out of San Francisco and the television networks based out of San Francisco. So in that context, it talks about, it has links to San Francisco Chronicle, Examiner, SF Weekly, and also links to uh, CNN, uh, BBC, MSNBC, etc. Now, the, uh, these newspapers are based out of San Francisco. Clearly, they're more local to San Francisco. And as we know, CNN, BBC, MSNBC are national level television networks. So they do not have that high degree of association with San Francisco. So with that in mind, our next task is to measure the localness of each entity with respect to a particular city. So we want to be able to say that the presence of San Francisco Chronicle indicates that the user provides some clue that the user is from San Francisco, but CNN or MSNBC in the tweets of a user do not particularly reflect if he's from San Francisco or not. So uh, we experiment with three classes of measures to identify the localness measure of an entity. First are the association-based measures, then graph-based measures, and then semantic overlap-based measures. So association-based measures have been used commonly for identifying uh, the relatedness between two words based on their occurrence in a large corpus. We use the same idea to measure the localness of an entity with respect to a city based on their occurrence in the entire Wikipedia dump. In this context, by occurrence, I mean the presence of the hyperlink to San Francisco or Golden Gate Bridge in the entire Wikipedia dump. So we measure the PMI of a city with res of an entity with respect to a city based on how many times there are links to the entity and the city together in the Wikipedia pages versus how many times they occur individually. The next class of me uh, measures that we uh, investigate are graph-based measures. The reason we look at graph-based measure is because the hyperlink structure of Wikipedia allows us to conveniently represent the local entities in terms of a graph. For example, consider this uh, snippet from the Wikipedia page of Boston. It has links to Boston Red Sox and American Green. So we create a graph of local entities for Boston, which has these three nodes, Boston Red Sox and uh, Boston Red Sox and American Green, an edge from Boston to Boston Red Sox indicates the presence of the link from Boston, uh, the Wikipedia page of Boston to Boston Red Sox. Similarly, so this is a directed graph. Similarly, if we look at the Wikipedia page of Boston Red Sox, it contains a link to Boston, Massachusetts and American League. So that results in an edge from Boston Red Sox to Boston and Boston Red Sox to American League. So we build a directed graph like this for all the local entities of a given city. So this is a directed graph of local entities of Boston. All the nodes represent all the local entities of the city and the edges represent the link, presence of a link from one node, from the Wikipedia page of one node to the other. Is it possible for us to run experiment? Uh, these links, in principle, you know the types of the links? because this is just a link from, but we can well, talk. Well, I mean, the simplify, for example, if the link is here because you use the media page, then the type of the link is media, right? We can probably use the semantic type of the entity itself. For example, Boston Red Sox is a sports team. Absolutely, so, yeah. you can use that, or you can, as I said, if the, the example is there, uh, it, it was on the, all those links came from media, right? From yeah. San Francisco. So you can use that also, right? Then the question is, um, is it possible to say uh, which type of these links uh, have been more contributed, you know, uh, are more predictive yes. for the 
local than the others. Uh, even the faster statuses of the, these type of links occur more often. Uh, in the uh, entities of certain types occur more often in the conversation of the users. And secondly, by which type uh, they are uh, more informative for uh, local uh, local maps. Yeah, so that's something we are considering as a part of our future work, where we consider the semantic types of each entity, mm -hmm. and we do some kind of study to understand what kind of entity, if we can assign weights to the mm -hmm. contribution of each entity. For example, maybe sports team has a higher weight, mm -hmm. and we give more that's weight for contribution to predict the location, yeah. and maybe newspapers and media channels, we give less weights. Now, perhaps a sports team where the field sentiment on that topic or entity is positive yeah. is the higher thing than, uh, you know, if you are, uh, you are in uh, Ohio and uh, you're going to talk about Michigan very often, uh, yeah. but uh, in a negative way, that's not a oh, good yeah. issue. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe I should add this. Uh, I think Mohit was looking at uh, that. So, so I think you, types, you initially talked about category hierarchy and uh, yes. content, and actually he was looking at the category, category hierarchy yeah. to So to I think what we did was we uh, we just picked up some random types. So to give you a context, he yeah. read the paper and he tried to improve the results. And he just randomly picked up some, uh, like intuitively what he felt, some semantic types that do not contribute. Categories. Yeah, some yeah, categories. categories. So he picked up, I think, food and uh, sports teams or something like that. And he just eliminated these from the uh, uh, knowledge base, and then said, "Okay, can we predict more?" I think his initial results were uh, it looked good, so we could probably use the semantic types too. <coughs> so coming back to this graph, we build a graph, a directed graph of local entities. This is for Boston. We do this for every city in our knowledge base, and we compute the importance of the entity of each of the local entity in this graph. So we compute the importance based on shortest path. So the greenest centrality is an importance measure for each node in a graph based on the number of shortest paths that, uh, that, pass, through the uh, that pass through that particular node. For example, uh, the, we compute the greenest centrality for an entity, uh, which is like uh, the aggregation of the fraction of shortest paths that pass through that node. Now, if we go back to this example, intuitively we think that Boston Red Sox, a baseball team based out of Boston, would be more local to Boston than American League, which is, uh, uh, which I believe is a baseball club from uh, the United States. It has a lot of teams, not very relevant to Boston, not very local with specific to just uh, with relationship to just Boston. So, by using this concept of assigning importance to nodes based on shortest paths that pass through each node. We find that Boston Red Sox has a much higher the greenest centrality measure than American League. So we use the greenest centrality to assign importance to each node. We use this as the localness measure of each entity in our knowledge base. The next class of measures that we investigate are semantic overlap measures. These are uh, based on the idea that higher is the overlap between the concepts of, uh, of a local entity and a city, higher is uh, the localness of the entity with respect to the city. So this is where we use the second level concepts. For example, if we consider San Francisco, these are the concepts in San Francisco. In Golden Gate Bridge, these are the concepts. We measure the localness of Golden Gate Bridge based on the overlap of concepts between Golden Gate Bridge and San Francisco. So considering these two uh, assets, we use two set-based similarity measures. The first measure we use is Jacquard index, which is a symmetric uh, similarity measure between two sets. So Jacquard index of a local entity with respect to a city is the intersection, is the found of the intersection of the concepts of the city and the entity divided by the count of the inter, uh, sorry uh, yeah divided by the count of the union of the concepts of the city and the entity. Now you'll notice that Golden Gate Bridge uh, is an important landmark of uh, San Francisco, but the Wikipedia page of San Francisco contains many concepts like uh, political figures and sports teams and uh, its geography 
landmark, weather, etc. The Jakar index of a local entity is going to be the highest when all the concepts of the local entity match with that of the city. So clearly that's never going to happen considering the variety of information we find in the city. So with that in mind, we used an asymmetric similarity measure <coughs> to compute the uh, similarity of the local entity with respect to the city. So the highlighted expression here is uh, the concepts found in the city, not found in the entity. And this expression is the concepts found in the entity, but not found in the city. Here we choose alpha 0 and beta as, as 1 because we want to penalize the local entity for every concept present in it that's not present in the city. And we do not, we set alpha is equal to 0. These are concepts present in the city, not present in the entity. We don't worry about that. We just want to penalize the local entity for concepts present in it, not present in the city. So now the Tversky index of a local entity is going to be the highest when, the, when all the concepts of the local entity match with every concept in that uh, uh, are present in the uh, Wikipedia page of the city. So, sorry, so does alpha plus beta, does that need to be equal to one? Oh, sorry? Does alpha plus beta, does that need to be equal to one? No, I think uh, you can choose alpha and beta. Uh, yes, I think in this uh, equation, yeah. They do need to be equal yes, to one, okay. Correct. So by using these localness measures, we create a knowledge base of local entities for each city. And uh, for example, this is uh, the local entities of San Francisco represented in a tag cloud, weighted by their localness measure. So we created a knowledge base of local entities and assigned a localness measure for each city. The next task is to create a semantic profile of a Twitter user based on their tweets. So we collect uh, the most recent tweets of a Twitter user whose location is to be predicted. And uh, the first step we perform in uh, creating the semantic profile is entity linking. That is identification of the entity Golden Gate Park and linking it to its uh, Wikipedia page. We use Zamanta for performing entity linking. It's a publicly uh, available and uh, it's publicly available to use as a web service. The next step is entity scoring. Uh, we score uh, the entities found in the tweets of a user based on their frequency. So as I said, we are predicting the location of a user based on a set of their uh, most recent tweets. Consider an active Twitter user who may tweet a lot about football. So chances are he'll tweet a lot about a lot of different football teams. But he'll tweet the most about uh, the football team from his city. So the use of uh, frequency gives us an indication as to the importance of the entity to the particular user. So the semantic profile of uh, the user consists of all the entities found in the tweets of the user along with the frequency of these. Uh, entities. So we created a knowledge base of entities, uh, local entities with respect to each city, and we created a semantic profile of user whose location is to be predicted with entities uh, from Wikipedia. Now we use the semantic profile along with the knowledge base to predict the most likely location of the user. For example, do you take into account uh, uh, misspellings or hashtags, those kinds of things? So we just use Zamanta, so any entity linking service that you're using, whatever they take into account. Zamanta takes into, it also considers hashtags, so if it's able to find any entities and hashtags, even that will be used. So we predict the location of a user based on the aggregate score. So for example, uh, for each city whose local entities are found in the uh, semantic profile of a user, we compute an aggregate score for each of those cities 
and we rank these uh, scores in descending order and use the top location with the maximum aggregate score as the user of, as the location of the user. Consider this example. So this is a profile of a user from our test data set. It consists of all the entities found in their tweets along with the frequency of the uh, entities. This is our knowledge base. It consists of, uh, for each city, consists of local entities and their localness measure with respect to that city. So our next task is to uh, compute an aggregate score for every city whose local entities are found in the user profile. So in this particular profile, we find that uh, there are local entities with respect to San Francisco, Oakland, uh, Detroit, and Palo Alto. So we compute this aggregate score, and we find that the aggregate score of San Francisco is the maximum. So we can take the location of this user to be in San Francisco. So uh, to evaluate our approach, we created a knowledge base of all the cities in the United States with population greater than 5,000. So ultimately, we had 4,661 cities with 500,000 local entities. To evaluate our localness measure, we considered all the, we implemented a baseline which considers all the local entities to be equally local with respect to the city. So the location prediction so is based. you say the uh, average number of local entities is only 25? No, 5,000, so, so only 100, uh, 100. So, yeah. In your I think there was that distribution, right? Yeah, Where she told us from. Uh, so for yeah. some cities, it's even 35, 40, like really small cities of the United States, because we are considering anywhere population greater than 5,000. At what level uh, things really start to look not too good, or because the uh, small cities have few entities, but uh, they are still more predictive because any occurrence of those entities is more predictive than the last city with many entities. So is there any um, sense that? things work out better for large cities versus small cities? So we did a separate evaluation for just the large cities. I did not do an evaluation for smaller cities, but I think that's something I can improve. I think uh, the, the converse there will be true. So since we are getting better accuracy for larger cities, our smaller cities would be getting lesser accuracy because the average is, mm. is coming off, right? So the evaluate our uh, approach on a publicly available data set published by Chen et al. It was collected from September 2009 to uh, January 2010. It contains 5,119 active users uh, from continental United States with approximately 1,000 tweets per user. The user's location is listed in the form of latitude <coughs> longitude. In our knowledge base uh, from Wikipedia, we extract the lat log of each location and we compute the distance between the actual location and the predicted location by using a straight line distance formula, which is the Eberstein formula for uh, distance between a pair of latitude and longitude. The evaluation metrics that we use are, uh, first is the average error distance. So the error distance is the uh, distance between the actual location of the user and the predicted location. The average error distance is the average of all the error distance across the uh, across all the users in the test data set. Accuracy is the percentage of users that we are able to predict accurately within 100 miles of their actual location. <coughs> so these are our results, and we see that um, Tversky index uh, as the localness measure of entities performs the best or helps us to uh, predict the more, most number of location, uh, users within their actual location. So with Tversky index, we get 54.48% of users uh, within 100 miles of their actual location. Uh, we compute accuracy at K based on, uh, by choosing the most closest location to the actual location of, a, of the user from the top K predictions of our approach. So we find that uh, PMI as a localness measure uh, works better than the baseline. 
but it is not normalized, so it's sensitive to the count of occurrences of the local entities in the Wikipedia dump. For example, uh, Glen Rock, New Jersey is a small city and its entities are relatively less frequent in the Wikipedia dump. So the absolute value of their PMI is much higher than that of San Francisco, which is more popular and whose local entities appear more frequently. Between is centrality uh, performs better than PMI, and uh, it does a good job of assigning low scores to very common entities like National Weather Service and uh, start startup company, etc. These are entities with respect to San Francisco. But we find that it fails for certain class of entities who maybe have some relevance to the city but uh, do not have a, a very distinguishing factor among other cities. For example, consider uh, IBM with respect to Endicott, New York. So IBM is considered to be the birthplace of Endicott, New York. Yeah. Endicott is. New York <laughs> is considered to be the uh, birthplace of uh, IBM, I'm sorry. So there's this entire section dedicated to the concepts of, uh, uh, to IBM, and it contains very IBM-specific concepts, like uh, CPR, punch cards, DJ Watson, etc. So because they are very specific to IBM, the between the centrality of IBM is very high. That is because all these concepts have shortest paths to other nodes in this city through IBM. But in reality, uh, today, uh, occurrence of IBM uh, really uh, is a uh, better prediction, you know, Hawthorne is a better choice for IBM uh, location than uh, Endicott. But IBM is still uh, a very popular entity, and I think in, uh, because of, uh, in tweets, we would find more occurrences of IBM, Facebook, Google, this is, these are more common entities and cannot really be used it's, as yeah, any yeah, okay, metric. We now, um, the question that occurred to me is that um, currently your distance that you predict is relatively high, right? Right. 100 miles, even more, right? What if I were to find, um, at least for some users, uh, occurrence of entities, um, say, my, in my top 25% of the entities uh, that are local, I consider, uh, some of them are things like um, uh, the famous street in San Francisco, which we know where it is. Uh, exactly, uh, or a certain restaurant, a very well-known restaurant, or a movie theater, or uh, there are a variety of things which have known locations. Right. And most of these uh, entities have known locations. And they occur often, that means we actually increase the, uh, of the 400 area, uh, kilometer area, or 100 kilometer area, whatever your area you're getting, I actually uh, bias it towards um, uh, most frequently occurring entities and their location and try to get a central, uh, you know, uh, in fact, I can make a simple thing, saying I have these 10 entities that occurs in this guy, I find their locations, and then I create the centroid for that and say that the, you know, this person actually is closest to this thing. Yeah, I talk about that in the future work. I think we can use that fact. So we have top five predictions. Uh, I mean, we can compute, say, top five or top eight or top eight, ten, something like that and then see if we, if we have like four cities of California and the top first, we are ranking something from uh, Texas or something, we, we want to say that, okay, that's more likely the user is from California, so we want to go to the next city in California, who is probably the location of the, which is probably the location of the user. Actually, here's another the thought that occurred to me when you're talking about the NFL team. So suppose you take somebody in Dayton. I mean, of course, we don't have any NFL team here, right? So. Right very likely that we might be a fan of some other team. So let's say I like 49ers and Giants and Broncos and I don't like uh, Seahawks. But my tweets might contain uh, these four. Right. So another way of maybe considering uh, my location or, it, or confidence in your prediction is to see what is the divergence. So let's say I'm using a lot of local entities here right. plus uh, others that uh, may throw you off. And so maybe you can, instead of picking the most likely, you might also add to that a confidence value. And on the basis of that, you might be able to actually better reflect uh, what we can mechanically do. Exactly. So we can use all of these different ideas that we have to assign a weight, which would be the uh, amount of contribution that a local entity makes to the location of the user. 
So maybe sports team don't, and maybe some thing, location names make more contributions, something like that, and use that to predict the location. That would also probably give us a confidence value as to how confident we are about a particular location. Yeah. Well, one means to improve the confidence using more semantics, other is to improve the localization yeah. uh, again using more semantics. <laughs> so next we see that uh, Jakarta Index obviously overcomes the disadvantage of the PNS centrality because we are considering overlap of concepts here. And, uh, but it underperforms for, uh, so Jakarta Index is a symmetric measure. So we see that it underperforms for local entities with fewer entities than the city. For example, consider this, where uh, uh, this set represents the entities of San Francisco, this set represents the ent entity of California, and this smaller set here represents Eureka Valley, which is a neighborhood in uh, San Francisco. So clearly, we would expect Eureka Valley to be more local to San Francisco than California, but that's not reflected in the overlap measure, uh, the Jakarta index measure. The use of uh, Tversky index, which is an asymmetric similarity measure, takes care of uh, this disadvantage because we are only penalizing Eureka Valley for concepts which are uh, present in this set, not present in San Francisco. So with that, we see that Eureka Valley uh, gets a higher localness measure than California with respect to San Francisco. This is a graph of the top A accuracy of uh, of all the users in our data, data set, we see that Tversky index performs the best. And at top five, we see that almost 80% of the users can be predicted. So this indicates that we do have evidence to predict the location of a user. So if we were to implement these approaches to assign different weights to the contribution of entities, we can probably uh, increase our uh, ability to accurately predict the location of users. Average error distance reflects the same. Uh, Tversky index performs the best, and at top five, uh, the average error distance reduces to almost 100 miles. This is a distribution of uh, the map on top is the distribution of all the users in our data set, and the map here is the distribution of uh, users who were predicted accurately within 100 miles. So we see that um, the prediction is not skewed to any particular location, and we are generally able to predict users from all locations. We compared our approach to existing approaches. Uh, these are uh, existing supervised approaches, where accuracy on the same data set is 51% and 49.9. We are able to uh, predict almost 55% of the users accurately in this data set. This graph uh, reflects that the more local entities we found in a user profile, the higher we were able to predict the location accurately. For example, uh, this number here shows that uh, when we found around more than 10 uh, local entities in a set of user streets, we were able to predict almost 66% of the users accurately within, their, uh, within 100 miles of their location. So this is intuitive in the sense that uh, the more evidence we find in the uh, tweets of a user, the higher is our ability to predict accurately. We did another evaluation on the top 100 cities of United States. These are top 100 most populated cities. I put in, you know, to me, the uh, uh, accu uh, comparison accuracy is a rather really you know, not sufficient uh, um, a comparison, uh, and it's not really showing the advantage of your technique because uh, the amount of effort that goes in the alternatives uh, is far more than the effort that goes in your uh, compared to, you know, for your uh, effort. Yeah, right. As I said uh, initially, like the major disadvantage for the other approaches is if they had to use their model for predicting users from, say, China or India. They would have to again go through the process of collecting geotagged data sets. Even for the US, even for whatever they have done, how much uh, effort they would have to put so to they get took the 50 five months, accuracy, right? They took five months to collect the geotagged training data set of tweets to build their model. No, but it's supervised, right? Yes. 
So how much uh, effort there will be gone uh, in terms of annotators? Uh, uh, in terms of so the collection, so uh, the tweets are not geo tagged by annotators. So mm. we collect, we fil use the streaming API to filter tweets which are already geo tagged with that long information. So the collection process of that takes five months because less percentage of tweets are geotagged and we want representative tweets from but all the regions. Did you not manually uh, do the page training set? No, oh. it's just the time that went into collection of that. So if now they want to build their model for India, they have to spend another five or six months to collect those tweets from India. Whereas our approach to create a location specific knowledge base from India, we just need the list of cities from India and do a single scan of the Wikipedia dump to create our knowledge base. I guess that's... That's a little unfair to say though, right? Because you're using their data that they took five months to collect. We are just using their approach, test right? data set. Just yeah. for testing. Yeah, we do not use their training data right. set. Okay. We don't, uh, we we don't haven't need trained data anything. Set. But yeah, uh, I think I kind of agree with Derek that it does not necessarily mean that you we would take or they would take five more months for collecting. Yeah, they haven't done any kind of uh, comparison on how much data they actually require to train and get to an accuracy of 55% so or 50% they have just told that we have collected 5 months data and our accuracy is 50% but if you we don't know other approaches uh, other approaches which are we not using their training data set people at a minimum take a month a month and a half to collect uh, geotag tweets from a region. Yeah. If you're considering just one state, it's probably a month or two. And if you're con considering like continental United States, then it's definitely more months. So about how long would it take to collect data, um, to collect enough tweets from a user to get that 10 to 15 local entity region that gives you good accuracy? So we, uh, if you're... Okay. Right here, right? So, in thousand tweet, uh, so for 1,000 tweets per user, we mm -hmm. found, I think, uh, I don't have the numbers, but uh, I don't know. I'm guessing 1,000 tweets are a good enough indicator for collecting at least 10 to 15 tweets. If you do not find 1,000 tweets, I'm not sure if you'll find it in more than that. Then we probably just give up and say that this user is not giving us enough, enough evidence. information. To you know, maybe they just tweet about a certain domain or something like uh -huh. that. And collection of 1,000 tweets using uh, the search API. Uh, well, it depends on the user, right? Mm. Like, you need a really active user to get 1,000 tweets out of them right. pretty quickly, right? But then if you consider all the applications of uh, Twitter, which are actually using users, I mean, are they are those applications interested in users like us who don't tweet much? Or are they looking for the section of users who tweet actively and can be... Yeah, I understand. I don't necessarily think this is a disadvantage for the types of applications that you're thinking about anyway. Okay. Um, just, in, you're interested in collecting people's home location, which is yeah. not necessarily like a time-sensitive thing to do. Like, you're not interested in their real-time location or anything like that. Sorry, I'll just add upon that, right? Uh, I think uh, for for tweets, for users who have 200 tweets and are able to have their language well enough to annotate 10 entities, I think that's good enough. Uh, the only difference here is that the training data uh, or the test data set, which, was, which already existed, they restricted users for 1,000 tweets. That doesn't mean that our approach or the approach which was here cannot do it for 200 tweets. Sure. Yeah. investigated measures to uh, establish the degree of association between a local entity and a city. And finally, we evaluated our approach on an existing data set and compared our approach to uh, existing supervised approaches. In future, we would like to uh, compute the confidence score of the prediction based on top K cities and uh, top K predictions and count of local entities in the tweets. Uh, we would like to investigate other uh, local measures for uh, scoring local entities. We would like to consider semantic types and categories of local entities and weigh the contribution based on types. And we would also like to explore other knowledge bases like uh, wiki travel and geonames.
probably consider it a future work as an extra source of uh, knowledge? Let's probably also get back to what Akshat mentioned about refining your location. Correct. Within Correct. 100 miles, you can probably pinpoint a street or probably a facility or something. Uh, yeah, so you know, for some applications, uh, uh, knowing the neighborhood will be very valuable. Okay. Right. And um, here's the thing. Um, among the active users in New York City, what percentage of the people I can identify, uh, uh, you know, by neighborhood? Uh, and the neighborhood could be either home place or workplace, either is okay. But this would be a very good uh, step to information that a, a, a advertiser need before deciding whether this is a viable method for campaign. Yeah. So I've mentioned this before too, too, but I feel like this is more of a classification problem than it is a, an estimation problem. Okay. Like estimating their fine grained position is not, I mean, because what you're doing is estimate, estimating home locations, right? right. So you have 5,000 cities, predict the most likely one, right? right. So it's yeah. kind of a classification problem. So in that sense, I think that average distance estimation accuracy is not a good, it's not a relevant measure at all, okay. right? I think the more relevant measures are your top K accuracies, okay. which you show is actually quite strong, right? right. And I've said before, it's unfortunate that you need to use that measure because all the other work in this space use that measure too, which I kind of, I mean, I disagree with personally. But that's why you look at these, you, it's like you have 300 kilometers off and it seems awful, but it's actually quite, well, so it's quite good relative to everyone else and it's not really relevant anyway, so I, right. I wonder if we should even consider it. Um, so that was cool. Did when, you when say I, uh, that the, uh, the location estimation is not useful? Well, so for example, if you're comparing, so, we're computing likelihood that the user is located in San Francisco compared to Seattle. And if Seattle is ranked one and San Francisco is ranked two and they're off, sure, then the distance is like, I don't know, that's like a 300 kilometer error, right? But it's actually, that's not very reflective because you're actually quite close to estimating the right distance. You're off by just a little bit. It was difference between one and two ranks, right? But when you do it by 300 kilometers, it seems that seems like it was really bad, actually. I agree with you. I think, I think, I think, uh, I think you go by the application. For example, if uh, I uh, if Twitter is trying to sell a targeted uh, a method for to target, uh, you know, uh, the advertisement for a, a retail store or for somebody to offer a coupon or somebody you know uh, uh, somebody who is uh, running a special sale. Uh, then um, a person living in, uh, you know, one part of New York City is not going to, you know, drop from Bronx is not going to go to Manhattan. Yeah, sure. So, so that, that um, you know, there are going to be applications where uh, knowing, uh, you know, whether you can get to the zip code and, um, um, you know, neighborhood level yeah. uh, would be very valuable. One, one yeah, I think the closest what percentage of the cases you can get to the zip code level and um, with uh, what confidence. Uh, those, that would be a very uh, valuable thing for many, let's say, uh, marketing centric uh, thing in my right. opinion. So in my, in my personal opinion, using a knowledge base like this, you can only get so deep, right? Okay. You can only get so finely, the locations can only become as fine as they're defined in the knowledge base, right? So you can't predict where somebody is located, the street they're located on, not if you don't have the street information in the Wikipedia, that's right? So that's not for this particular uh, knowledge base where I consider mm -hmm. the cities. But if you consider New York City, right? For uh, for like Midtown Manhattan, there is a Wikipedia page with Absolutely, a lot of yeah. information. Yeah. But so that getting down to that borough level is doable. So, so, for, so it, it, for example, um, Macy's uh, in New York, where there is Macy's Square. And uh, the guy talks about the Macy's uh, uh, not just during the parade time, but actually throughout the year. That gives me a lot more confidence that uh, you know he is uh, in that general area. And uh, I would you know uh, somebody particularly e-commerce uh, kind of thing or you know local merchant uh, could potentially use that much much better as an example. So those are the, and in that case the point here is that there. Uh, there are entities, local entities, so-called, like uh, San Francisco Bay Bridge or the uh, New York Knicks, not useful. And that's why in my example, I was telling that, hey, if you actually can find a famous restaurant, if find a, a movie theater, find um, uh, anything that has, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, the mention of Madison Square Garden very often, because he's, this guy is going to Madison Square Garden, then those, those would be very, uh, locations associated with those entities are, 
valuable. If they won't be valuable for um, uh, uh, entity like New York Knicks or other things, the 49ers are uh, going to be um, appealing the, for the entire metro, metro area. So they are less indicative. There, so there is a localization value for the entity that you find. And you can actually segregate the entities, uh, local entities, into the ones that are highly predictive of local, uh, local, uh, you know, location, and others that are not. Love it. So it's like an integration of broad or local appeal of an entity or something like that, right? Uh, do you think uh, <coughs> uh, using uh, slangs or abbreviation will be useful, like uh, SFO or Buckeye State? So they are like a short abbreviations or. Uh, so things like SFO, uh, Samantha is able to link them to San Francisco City. So the entity linking module, whatever you use, whether Samantha or Wikipedia Spotlight, as long as that has the ability to, for example, I have seen feeds where City by the Bay is nicknamed for San Francisco, and Samantha is actually able to uh, annotate those. So as long as your entity linking module, if you want to do any more additions to that and involve uh, and be able to use nicknames, so the, do they also consider like a variation in the names, like you had San Francisco Museum of Art, so right. if somebody just mentioned Art Museum San Francisco, something like so that. So all of that, I think as long as that is incorporated in the okay. entity linking module, that helps. So if you consider to predict the location by tagging, like identify only location, will it help? Or like let's for only example, location so names. Yeah, like entities of like places. So if you, in your example, right, I, I don't have much idea, but you may know, uh, talking about Red Sox, the football, uh, baseball team, yeah. maybe somebody outside New York may be talking it much often, but he's not in New York, or Boston. Uh, but let's say he's talking about the stadium that he says is a verb. I went to watch the baseball mm -hmm. Red Sox and went verb. Mm -hmm. Then it may help to increase the accuracy. Yeah, so I think you can consider, uh, I mean, we don't do any analysis or syntactic analysis of the sentences to like identify verbs or things like that. But yeah, I think that might, that might Maybe help. a simple experiment would be like just to identify the places and then see what Right. And see if there are any activity at that place. Yep. For an example, you can consider the temporal aspect, right? So you yep. get the tweets and identify like which time frame the mm -hmm. tweets are. So probably if I go to California during that time, I might tweet more about the cities in California while not in other times. So probably that's a very good point. And uh, Dr. Prasad, if you remember, you had mentioned the exactly same thing to identify traveling users. Uh, consider if the entities are mentioned across, uh, since we are collecting thousand feeds, are they mentioned across different months or is it like in a particular few days he has mentioned a lot of entities for a particular location, then we discount that, yeah, that can be considered. And traveling users are, uh, are a main reason why we do not see uh, good accuracy, so they are falsely predicted because we see a lot of entities for users who are traveling and comparatively less for their actual location, so if we discount the traveling entities, Simple, simple heuristics that uh, most of the travels will be uh, weak or less. Right. And uh, you, if you can find out that uh, uh, the distribution of the location uh, you know, uh, is uh, very different for some you know, period of time, right. then um, just uh, ignore that and, and then it will. So he, he has another thought that crossed my mind, uh, which is uh, related to trustworthiness of your tweet. So suppose I don't, I'm not that interested in knowing the location, but rather if, if let's say the person is tweeting about some place that he is not actually at, and and we can use that divergence to say that there is some, this, probably this tweet is fake. So maybe there is something that we can uh, try to investigate, because that will confound with uh, this traveling kind of a person, but on the other hand, in the hazard uh, or uh, those kinds of situations, maybe if somebody is trying to tweet as if he is at, at that location, then maybe we can try to verify whether that is in fact the case or not. Yeah, I'm a little fuzzy about the whole thing, but it's worth uh, thinking in terms of, because
there we don't need accuracy, but I'll just know that that the past history is very different from the current so one and okay. investigate why that is so. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, um, yeah, as you mentioned, it is expensive to for the other approaches to get those words and those things. But I was thinking that um, um, what do you think about for uh, can uh, the accuracy be improved using their using your approach and then also their score of train model and. are complementary and they cater to certain classes of the Twitter users. So for example, if you have in your network a lot of users, like more than 30, 35 users who have published their location voluntarily, the best approach is to use a network-based approach. If there are a lot of entities, the best, the most accurate approach is going to be a knowledge-based approach. If there are no, uh, if the number of local entities are very less, then probably using the distribution of words is going to be a better approach. So I think a commercial application like Twitris should use a combination of all these approaches to see which, uh, for a particular user, which model <coughs> gives the most uh, highest confidence measure and use that. Uh, so a hybrid approach generally would work. I think somebody can develop confidence measure uh, across these different types of things. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. was generally because uh, the errors were generally because we did not find enough entities in the uh, tweets of a user. So when the local entities are really less, less than five, then there's no, I mean, there's generally uh, not enough evidence to predict the location, but then it's quite random as to, you know, maybe there is just some random mention of a city and we predict that as the location of the user. So I feel the problem is um, less number of entities found in a user's tweet as opposed to uh, more mentions of a popular city or something like that. Oh. So these are users who, uh, for example, even if you consider somebody in the lab, right, we are not active Twitter users in terms of tweeting about where we go, what to do, and things like that. We tweet more about technology and conferences and things like that. So generally finding clues in our tweets is very difficult. So for this category of users, this approach would generally not work. So as I said, for that, the hybrid kind of approach works the best, where you identify what class of approach can work better for this particular user and use the confidence measure. So speaking to Alan's point a little bit, um, I guess every each of the um, metrics that were considered, and this is kind of this is what just kind of came to me as I was listening to your talk today. They all have a certain bias towards them with respect to how many local entities that are located on, Wiki on Wikipedia on the knowledge base, right? Like the between the centrality is not useful at all when there's a very small number of local en entities. You need a large number of entities. But for like the diversity index, it actually penalizes local entities if they have a large number of, sorry, if it has a large number of local entities associated with it, right? Diversity index penalizes if there are concepts in that local entity which are not found in the city. Right, so the more local entities that there are in the city, the more likely it is that you're going to penalize that local concept. Uh, no, that would happen in checkout index, but with diversity index, uh, so I'll only be penalizing Eureka Valley for all these concepts which are not present in the city. Ah, uh, I see. So, it subsumes. I see, I see. So the, 
Okay, so that penalizes if there are fewer entities in the city. It does not so penalize the, the local entity for anything that's there in the so city. So I shouldn't say penalize, I should say likelihood of penalizing, right? Because there are fewer, if there are fewer concepts in the city, it's more likely that fewer you're going concepts to Fewer concepts in the city, yeah. It's Compared more likely that, that there will be no overlap. Yes. Yeah. So I feel like there is some, so there is, you know, given that these different localist measures are biased, and it seems like they're biased in different directions, okay. right? So could there be any merit in combining these local list measures, therefore, in order to do the ranking? I, I don't know what that combining looks like, but do you yeah. think do you think it do you think it makes sense? Like, do you think, for example, Petrina's Petrina's sensorality says something that Traversky doesn't, that PMI doesn't, right? Like, do you think they each have something, have unique information that they're contributing that could help? Some more to, uh, figure that out. Yeah, I'm wondering too. I don't like. I don't really know the answer to that question. I, I, I can maybe let me. I, I'll, I'll come to her defense somewhat. Uh, <laughs> actually, in the literature uh, that she looked at, she actually found about 50 different metrics, mm -hmm. and it is very hard to rationalize or clearly verbalize exactly what each uh, does. And and what people have done in the literature is to just do this uh, number jugglery and. Uh, throw something out there and nobody has actually uh, conclusively said one is superior to the other and and I think I can understand because we are using it on 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 documents and and tweets and other things where people didn't write it with any particular rationale behind behind that and, and given that scenario we are unable to actually properly see which one will definitely work out I mean we have some hacks as to why some one may be superior to the other but but if you kind of skew the data set, then maybe our guesses might go wrong. So, yeah. So I definitely understand. I don't need to. I don't need to suggest that, like drilling or anything like that. Given the fact that we really don't know what are good baseline measures, and people are just throwing stuff yeah, at it right, and right. see what happens. I mean, in that kind of sense, then doing combining these measures make actually make a lot of sense, right? It's like. Like doing uh, like ensemble-based learning, right? Where you just have tons of learners, you throw them all out, and then you okay. average their results or something like that, right? right? And the other issue that she ran uh, ran into is that suppose we want to compare with other measures, right? We didn't have their implemented system readily accessible to run. Oh, right? sure. So we can't code all of well, those. Well, particularly things. because your system is so unique compared to what else is out there, I think it's right. like comparisons are kind of surface level. In fact, that's the best you can do anyway. All right, uh, uh, excusing the audience.